Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to The Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind. My name is Camel, and today we'll be taking a long overdue look at all of the Easter eggs and interesting secrets that can be found within Morrowind's final expansion, Blood Moon. And that's right, it's an expansion pack. It predates DLC. That's how overdue this video is. And you did hear correctly, there are going to be a bunch of secrets in this video that aren't strictly Easter eggs, but I do believe you will find equally as interesting, if not more so. Now timestamps for each secret and Easter egg in this video can be found down in the description and in the comments. Now down there in the old description, you can also find all of my social media links. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter and be sure to join our brand new Discord server. With all that said and done, let's get into Blood Moon. The first one is super weird, and I have covered in my 10 most hidden unique items in Morrowind. You can check that out above if you so wish. And I just remembered it even got an endorsement from Notch, the guy that invented Minecraft. Anyway, for this first easter egg, we'll need to have finished the Blood Moon expansion's main quests. It's quite a task, but once all that good stuff is done and has been finished, what now? Well, what we'll need to do is make our way to the Skull Village. Here, we will need to enter the Great Hall of Skull Village, where we can find some locals mulling around like spices swilling in mead, as they bathe in the warmth of the hearth thawing out from the clawing cold winds outside. But there is one decoration in here that stands out, the centerpiece of the room, the stuffed cliff racer hanging from the ceiling. And it's the best kind of cliff racer, a dead one. Now while that is interesting in itself, there is something even more interesting, as if we stare at it for too long, we'll spy a sparkle in the mouth of the foul beast. This is an item called the Blue Deb's Ring of Viewing, and it will only appear after the Blood Moon DLC main questline has been completed. So this is all well and good, but what is this thing? And why does it have such a strange name and what does it actually do? Well, once we pick it up, we can find it in our inventory as we would expect. But when we equip the ring, something very strange will happen. A list of options will pop up, each labeled with a unique name referencing the different cutscenes that play throughout the Blood Moon expansion's main questline at certain integral stages. As you may expect, clicking any of the options will play the relevant cutscene. Now you can do this as many times as you want and it will stay in your inventory for you to use whenever you so wish. This is interesting because it's the kind of item that you'd traditionally only be able to find with console commands, you know, in a developer's room or a cutting floor, something like that lingering in the dark guts of the game. But to have something like this actually in-game and obtainable is superbly unique. Now the name of the ring, the Blue Devs Ring of Viewing, comes from Mark Nelson, one of Morrowind's writers and quest designers. His username on the Elder Scrolls forum and Twitter were Blue Dev, stemming from his passionate following of the Duke Blue Devils basketball team. Mark Nelson was also the one responsible for implementing probably the most interesting easter egg in Morrowind. You can check that out in Morrowind's easter egg video that's already done. But for now, the Blue Devs Ring of Viewing. Grab it, stick your finger in it, and have fun while you're doing it. Ah yes, in the region of the is Infia Plains, we can find a frozen barrow called Bjorn. Inside, we will find a number of free tags, but along with them, we'll also see something we saw repeated in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim as an easter egg. There is a skeleton hanging upside down, its feet deeply encased within the icicle hanging from the ceiling. Sticking from the snowed grounds beneath him is an enchanted silver longsword called Icicle, which, thanks to its frost enchantment, glows with a faint blue magical shimmer. Now this is of course a reference to Star Wars Episode V The Empire Strikes Back, when Luke Skywalker was caught on Hoth and hung from the cavern ceiling by the Womba as a tasty snack for later on. As he's not cold enough to eat yet, he's still warm. Luke warm. Of course, with this sword icicle taking the place of Luke's lightsaber, which is blue, just as the colour of the frost enchantment on the silver blade is. Sadly, this person didn't have telekinesis or the force, and suffered an icy fate. And when it came to life, they quite literally got cold feet. Ah, now while exploring the northeastern shores of the Felsard coast, we can run across an ice barrow called Frossel. Inside, we will be met by a very small abode, home to Reekling. We'll also find a Reekling boar master, but he's not worth talking about. With me yapping away, there's enough masters of boring people in one video. Now behind him, we'll see there is a pen full of tusked bristlebacks. And it's a mess. Some might even call it 
a pigsty. Now along with the bristlebacks we can find two skeletons. It would seem the Reekling have been feeding people to their beloved boars. Now one of the skeletons lies face down in the cold iced floor with a bloody note in hand. It reads, Borogon, Jux put the stash in Fiel Ice Cave and Lucian has been notified. I got my cut and am headed back to Somerset Isle. I'll see you there. One more thing, do me a favour and forget your obsession with bristleback meat. Yeah, it probably tastes like pork, but it's not worth it. Those things are deadly, and their creepy little writers are more vicious than they look. Now, the note is meant to be signed by one Antoinette, but it seems I have a mod that has forgotten that bit. But as we can see in the construction set, this note is in fact signed by her, which is very important. So this here corpse, I would assume, is Borogon as he carries the items of a thief. And it looks like he found Antoinette's note and didn't forget his love of bristleback meat. Tried to get some and ended up, quite ironically, being their dinner instead of them being his. Anyway, in the note it mentions Fiel Cave where more treasure is. Let's head there. This can be found a ways way to the southwest in the Is In Fier Plains quite near the Tree Stone. Once inside we'll be met by a skeleton and Graal. Growls are these weird creatures that for some reason didn't make an appearance in the Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, despite them being native creatures of Solstheim. Hmm. Now we'll get back to the skeleton later on, but further into the cave we'll find some Reekling and then a long ice tunnel where we will eventually have to swim through an icy blue flame underwater cavern thing which is very strange, but we will emerge into this open room with three Fearsome Growl. And yes, that's what they're called, they're called Fearsome Growl for some reason and they're unique to this cave and they're actually weaker than their standard Growl counterparts. Anyway, at the back in the center of this little room we can find a chest with some gold and stacks of potions. This must be the treasure that Antoinette spoke of in the note. But if we open the chest there's nothing inside, literally nothing. This couldn't be all the treasure could it, what's on the outside? Perhaps someone came and took it. Hmm. Well at first we are miffed, if we take a look at the back wall we can see an arrow of sorts. Upon a closer inspection we'll see that this arrow is actually entirely comprised of diamonds. So I sure hope we got some vegetarians in the house, because there's a lot of carrots here. Now if we follow the arrow down, it just points to the ground, but this lump of ice here is actually a hollowed out ice rock, inside of which we can find all of the treasure. There are five diamonds, there are six emeralds, there are six pearls, there are six rubies, and there is a second bloody note, just like the one we found in the other cave. Now this one reads, Lucian, here's the loot from the jeweler heist. Like my marker, I figured that would get your attention. The Growl make great guards, and I knew that you'd be able to slip past them. I've paid off the crew and given the guild its cut. I'll see you in Cyrodiil at the inn we talked about. The museum should be an easy haul, security is light, and there's a broken window in the basement. But we can talk more about that later. Signed, Jux. Interesting. Now if we go back to the skeleton at the start of the cave, I would assume that this is Jux as on his corpse we can find the tools of a thief. And if this was Lucian, surely he would have taken the loot which was left for him, which is still there. Also in Jux's hand we can find yet another diamond. Now, what's interesting about this series of notes is the two people mentioned, Antoinette and Lucian, both of which are dark brotherhood members and characters in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Now they also weren't part of the Thieves Guild, and they're the only two thieves to have survived this, so it would appear that they could have very well been on a contract to kill these two thieves, as they work for of course the Dark Brotherhood. Also, the inn mentioned in the note in Cyrodiil is likely the inn of Ill Omen, where in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion we meet Lucian for the first time. So that's a really cool foreshadowing of adventures to come, as Blood Moon was released about three years before the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Now, I'm sure we've all heard of the East Empire Company no thanks to Skyrim, but it was also in Morrowind and in Blood Moon. Now the East Empire Company is a reference to the East India Company, which was an English and later British joint stock company that ended up trading mainly with Qing China and seizing control of the Indian subcontinent. Much like how the East Empire Company here in the Elder Scrolls has taken control of areas rather than simply trading with them. 
as we see right here in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind's Blood Moon expansion as they build and mine in the town of Ravenrock, destroying local crypts and wildlife and raging the natives as they tarnish local traditions. Yep, yeah, sounds pretty similar to me. Now, within the Thursk Mead Hall, found in the frozen heights of the Felsard coast, we can find a Nord man called Bathmar Bold Loot. Naturally, as he is a bard, he carries a loot. But if he happens to die under any non-suspicious circumstances, we get to rummage through his corpse, where we'll see that his loot is actually one of three Easter egg loots in the game. It's not just any loot, it's a fat loot. Now this phrase, fat loot, is used within gaming, particularly MMORPGs, and refers to really good loot drops. You know, you kind of get to the end of a dungeon, you defeat the final boss, there's a monthly reward, there's a chest, something you work towards, you finally kill that raid boss, so on and so forth. The really good loot you get is referred to as fat loot. So what we see here in the Elder Scrolls is quite literally a fat loot. And we do see two other fat loots in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind base game, which I did cover in the Easter egg video for that, which again you can check out up above. Now in the Mosering Mountains we can find a small ice cave called Leg. Inside we will find an ice tunnel, sitting in which is a skeleton, suggesting something hasn't gone quite right. At the end of the tunnel we will find wolves and bears, and the dead remains of people who tried to settle this cavern as their home. On the ground in the back corner of this room we can find a settler's journal next to a skeleton. Entry 1. Today we found the perfect place to claim as our new home. It's an ice cave called Lake and seems to be used by local bears and wolves of some kind of den. They should be easy enough to get rid of. Entry 2. We've done it! The bears and wolves have been driven from the cave and we've already started making ourselves at home. May our children's children enjoy the comfort of leg. Entry 3. One of those blasted bears got into the cave today. We drove him out, but he managed to make off with our dinner. It's a good thing I have my grandfather's enchanted ring to keep them at bay. And given that's the end of the journal, and it's found next to a skeleton, I'm gonna say they didn't win the next fight with the bears and wolves. Now when we walk into this room, the animals in here are alerted to our presence and they will attack us but you might have just seen something really weird that you weren't expecting. One of the bears, when it is first alerted to your presence, its first attack is a fireball that it shoots out of its mouth. It only does this once and will only do it as soon as it knows you're there. It's a bear <laughs> that shoots a fireball out of its mouth. I mean, uh, what, what? that's just quite frankly weird, but there is an explanation for it. As if you kill this bear that shoots the fireball out of its mouth, on its corpse we can find the Ring of Wizard's Fire. Now this would be the ring that the guy who wrote the journal referred to. Now that guy that owned the ring was eaten by the bears, as we can even find human flesh inside this bear. So this bear ate the dude, ate the ring, and now because the ring's in its stomach, has the ability to shoot fireballs during combat. I mean, a fire-breathing bear, that's pretty cool and quite frankly belongs in a circus. I mean, we've all heard of polar bears, but I've never heard of a solar bear. This next one sure is weird, and you really wouldn't know about unless I told you, so here we are. On PC, if we hit the tilde key, this will open up the console, where we can enter a series of console commands to alter the game as we so please. You know, do things like turn on god mode, spawn items into the game, change the time of day, so on and so forth. Now there is a command, which is COC. This stands for Center on Cell. Now if we type COC and then we type a cell ID, a cell being an area of the game world, this will transport our player to whatever cell we typed in. For example, if we type COC Vivek Palace of Vivek, upon hitting enter the command will be executed and our player character will be transported to the Palace of Vivek via this COC console command. All make sense? Cool. Now the Blood Moon expansion takes place on Solstheim. Now if we go into the console and type COC Solstheim, you'd think that we'd be transported to the island of Solstheim, but instead we are teleported to a completely blank, dark, black space, where we will find ourselves inside a statue. And more so, we'll find ourselves literally inside the, uh, the uh, marble bag of Moagbal. 
well, a statue of Balok Bal. If we turn the clipping off, we can fly around, and yeah, it's just an empty space with nothing other than a statue of Molok Bal for company. Now this is pretty weird, because Blood Moon's main questline is based around her scene and the Great Hunt, which quite frankly has nothing to do with Molok Bal. So it is a true mystery, while Solstheim's cell ID transports us to this place. It seems the Daedric Prince of Domination dominates even the cell IDs in Morrowind. Arr, now this one's pretty cool. On the southeastern coast of Solstheim, in the Herstang Forest, just east of the Ignir River, we can find the Nordic burial mound known as Hibbelhost Barrow. Inside, we'll find a number of skeletal pirates, and at the back we can find their leader, the Skeleton Pirate Captain. When we stab him in the eye eye captain and kill him, that's so bad. On his brittle, plunderous bones, we can find the unique sword known as Sea Splitter, along with the pirate captain's key, be sure to grab that, as well as the pirate captain's note, which reads, near the mighty sun's great stone, an arch marks withered flesh and bone. And at the base, you'll know sweet luck if dig you will straight through the muck. Interesting. Now be sure to take this as we venture to unravel this clue. To the northwest, we can find the Great Sunstone standing proudly in the gentle northern snowfall. To the north of this, as we push through the thick pine of the Herstang Forest, we'll find the Arch of Rock the note mentioned. This is the Vald Brandir Barrow. Now instead of going inside the tomb, what we want to do is be cheeky and go around the back. Where, in a depression, along with my current mental state, we'll also find a pile of muck. Now this is hiding something. If we pick up all of the muck, as the note suggested we do, it will reveal the pirate's treasure chest, which has a lock level of 100. Luckily for us, we have the key, which we'll use to pry back the rusted pins and open it up. Inside we'll find a bountiful trove of gems and coin. Specifically, 5,000 gold, 3 rubies, 1 pearl, 4 emeralds, 3 diamonds, 3 exquisite rings, and 2 exquisite amulets. And if I had to judge the quality of the loot out of pastry-based goods, I'll definitely give it a pie. That's right, a pie rate. <sniffs> Ugh, god that's bad. Now on the eastern side of the island we have the Felsard Coast. Right about in the middle we have the Thursk Mead Hall, just up the hill from the eastern shores of Lake Fjelding. It's exactly what you would expect it to be, a mead hall, kind of oddly placed in the middle of nowhere, making it, to be fair, a welcome half to find for any weary travellers. Now to find what we're here for, we'll need to head around to the back of the Thursk Mead Hall, past the hut and smithy, where we'll find a tree stump, which is actually a hollow tree stump. Inside we will find an array of items. The unique sword Shadow Sting, the unique ring, the ring of Raven Eye, the unique gloves Treachery and Deceit, and five of the most powerful arrows in the game, the Ebony Arrows of Slaying, which are also the most damaging weapons in the game. But what is of great interest to us, for this video anyway, is this note, a bloodstained note, which reads, S, here is the equipment I told you about. Remember, the weak deserve no mercy. Signed, E. Now these two mysterious S and E characters who left such a treasure trove of unique items are never revealed. And, it turns out, as time has revealed, are fictional reoccurring characters in the Bethesda Game Studios games. As, in Fallout 3, outside of Megaton, we can find a hollowed out rock, inside of which is a bunch of juicy loot and a hollow disc titled As Requested. S, here's the stuff you wanted. If anyone asks where you got it, just say it was a gift from your grandma. Happy hunting, signed E. So it is signed to and by the same S and E we find here in Morrowind. And even beyond this, in Fallout 4, outside the Museum of Witchcraft, we can find a hollowed out rock with a bunch of thick boy loot and also a note. Yes, been too long, sorry I missed you in Megaton, looks like history repeats itself. But, as promised, here's the gear I scrounged up. All the best and stay safe, for Commonwealth is its own kind of hell. Signed, E. So it all started here in Blood Moon, 
and these reoccurring mysterious characters continue on throughout the BGS legacy. It will be interesting to see if we can find this S and E again in future titles. Now during or after the Skull Test of Strength, if we visit the Thursk Mead Hall, we'll find almost everyone dead. Arrows line the walls, corpses line the floors, everyone we once knew here is dead. Except for one sole survivor, Svenja Snowsong. She will inform us that they were attacked by a creature known as the Udefrikt. Now this name Udefrikt means Beast Fear as Ude means beast and Frikt means fear in Norwegian. Now this mythical creature is rumored to live near Lake Fjelding, and sure enough at the lake's edge we can find its lair. And again, sure enough in here we will find the great mythical creature the Ude Frikt, the likes of which we see in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, but you'll have to watch this video here for more on that, as we even see Svenja Snowsong the woman who gave us the quest to kill the Artifleet, as she went on a quest of her own that did not end well. But anyway, more on that in that video. So upon slaying this fell beast, we must take its heart, and while we're at it, we can also find it carrying a unique one-handed blunt weapon, known rather literally as the Severed Nord Leg. This thing won't give any other weapons a run for their money, as its base stats are very low. It seems they're suffering from a case of athlete's foot. But speaking of, there is a cut enchantment in the game files for this weapon. Its ID is severed leg underscore en, within the game's construction set that is. It consists of a low magnitude frenzy humanoid and weakness to common disease effects on the target and it damages the personality of the user. Kind of reminds me of the weaponized hoe in Oblivion, again reference the aforementioned video for more on that. So anyway, grab the leg, grab the heart, head back and finish the quest and all the rest. Upon doing so, we will be rewarded with a unique Nordic longblade called Clanbringer. Now, this whole thing is one great big allusion, nod and reference to the poetic epic Beowulf. The Udfrikt parallels Grendel, the troll-like creature that attacked Herot, the mead hole from Beowulf. And much like Grendel the monster, the Udfrikt was defeated by a hero from a foreign land, that hero being us in this case. Now the severed Nord leg that the Udfrikt carries and uses is an allusion to the arm that Beowulf cuts off of Grendel. Also, the mead hole that was attacked in Morrowind Thursk, its original founder was a man named Hrothmund. Hrothmund was the name of one of the sons of King Hrothgar from the epic Beowulf. Also, the sword we are gifted upon completing the quest, Clanbringer, is an allusion to Neiling, which was a sword gifted to Beowulf for defeating Grendel. So yeah, wow, a rather epic easter egg in honor of a rather epic tale. Now, upon locating the crashed Dwemer patchwork airship at the southern base of the Mosering Mountains, we can find the journal of the dead captain next to his corpse. While it's all very interesting, we are more interested, or specifically interested, in Entry 7. It's normal for a crew member to get edgy, but the Argonian finally went berserk. I told him repeatedly before we left Aldrun that an airship sails in the sky, and not on the water. He told me he understood, but his fear of heights must have finally taken sway. In a frenzied state, he grabbed the wheel and almost forced us into the sea. I had no choice but to run him through. Swims in Swells was his name, and a good crew member he was before this unfortunate incident. I would have preferred a burial at sea, but considering our current situation, we had no choice but to toss his body overboard. We aimed for the ocean. But by that time the airship had drifted over Solstheim. Alas, I fear we missed and his corpse landed somewhere on the southeastern shore. Now interestingly, if we explore the southeastern shores of Solstheim, we can actually find poor old Swims in Swells' corpse broken and bent over a large jagged stone column sticking out of the coastline. It looks like Swims in Swells ended up doing anything but that. If he thought he was having a hard time on the ship, well he got a really hard time on this rock. 
Now in the base game of Morrowind on a small island in the northeastern corner of the Shio Gorad region's upper archipelago, we can find Maik the Liar on his own little island. This was his first appearance in any Elder Scrolls game. Anyway, along with a bunch of strange topics, we can talk to him about multiplayer. Maik does not know this word. You wish others would help you in your quest, coward! If you must, search for the Argonian I'm Leet, or perhaps the big Nord Rolf the Uber. They will certainly wish to join you. Now this is funny and a little indirect jab from the devs at those who wanted multiplayer in an Elder Scrolls main series game, but he does mention a big Nord named Rolf the Uber. Well, on Solstheim, deep within the Izinfir Plains, we can find a big Nord called Rolf Longtooth. While his name isn't exactly the same, he does fit the description and he does have the same first name. Sadly, he has no dialogue in regards to multiplayer, but he may be a nod to the Rolf that Maik the Liar mentions. On the northern shores of the Mosring Mountains region of Solstheim, we can find an ice barrow called Ben Kongurike. In here, we will find ice, ice, and more ice, along with a bunch of random leveled foes. Now, at the end of one of the cave systems, we can find a dead Nord sorceress named Frisa. She has been mostly buried in snow, but if we clip through the ground, we can see there is a Nord here. On her corpse, we can find a short journal. I've done it. The enchantment is now complete. The robe, which I have named White Walker, can turn the wearer into the very essence of snow. Kick me out of the Mages Guild, will they? Hmm, now I'll show them all. Wow, looks like Frieza here made herself a little too literally into snow. Anyway, along with a journal on her corpse, we can also find the unique enchanted robe named White Walker. Interestingly, when we take it off of her corpse, her eyes will open. And if we go back to the tunnel, there's a very specifically suspicious part of her body sticking out of the snow. Anyway, this robe White Walker has some really, really, really bad enchantments on it. All of these are constant effects. It chameleons on self by 50 points, that's really good. It does frost damage 5 to 10 points on self, that's not so good. It gives you a weakness to frost 5 to 10 points on self, not good. And it also drains health 5 to 10 points on self, not good. Now again, all of those are constant effects, so you will be constantly damaged and soon die after equipping the robe, just as Frieza here did. Now this robe, White Walker, is an allusion to the White Walkers from a Song of Ice and Fire series, best known for its TV series Game of Thrones. The first book in the series, which was named A Game of Thrones, was released in 1996, nine years before Blood Moon was released. In this, as I'm sure we all know, there are these frozen undead dudes called White Walkers. Well, we too are in an icy and frozen setting, much like where the White Walkers dwell, and when we equip this robe in-game White Walker, thanks to the robe's enchantments, we metaphorically become a walking dead man, just as the White Walkers are literally in Game of Thrones, as wearing the robe will kill us very soon. And the White Walker robe is so ugly, it's about as hard to look at as season 8 of that show. Now in the Skull Village, we can find an interesting assortment of characters, one of which is a Nord Barbarian called Lasnir who gives us a quest to find his son, Timvol, who has fallen down the well. Now the quest itself is quite fun and has some twists and turns, but where the gem of this interaction lies is in the two characters' names and what happened to one of them. Lasnir gives us a quest about Timvol, who fell down a well. This is in reference to the ye olde time TV show Lassie, about a dog, Lassie, and her human companions, one of which was Timmy. Lassie would wolf 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 to let the humans know something was wrong, which has led to a modern trope of, what's that Lassie? Timmy fell down the well? Anyway, despite that being in TV culture, there isn't actually a single episode in which Timmy falls down a well. Although there is one episode which Lassie falls down a well. But for what we have here, Lasnir is a reference to the dog Lassie, as he alerts us to Tim Vol, who of course is a reference to Timmy, Lassie's owner, who has of course fallen right into the trope and has fallen down a well. Although the truth of what happened here is much different. Now while in the Imperial Castle of Fort Frostmoth, we may just hear a rumour 
of a strange man dancing through the woods and sneaking into the castle at night to leave Moonsugar as a gift for the children and spike all of the castle's rations with the same elsewherian narcotic before prancing off into the dark pine as he sings rhyme and poem. A very obscure story indeed, likely that of a local folktale. But there has actually been a number of the castle's residents becoming sick because of their rations being spiked and filled with moon sugar, leading to even addictions within the castle's ranks, the most recent victim being Jaylene, the imperial cult priest. So this mystery must be solved as it's not so sweet and causing havoc around Fort Frostmoth. Well, if we journey northeast and into the southeastern corner of the Izinfier Plains, where they meet the bordered hills of the Felsard coast, we'll spot a petite and rather quaint little cabin nestled lonely and picturesque into the wilderness, the chimney bellowing puffing away a thick white smoke into the wintry air. Now as cute and wholesome as this is, it's not too cute, as next to the cottage is a ditch with a dead Khajiit in it. Fun fact, there are actually no living Khajiit on Solstheim. Anyway, this guy's name is Minashi, and he will be carrying moon sugar and an alchemy skill book, which is actually no book at all, but instead the song of Uncle Sweetshare, which will be quickly read as we'll hear it again soon. He he ha ho to the workshop people go, my uncle's candy is so sweet, it's such a yummy winter's treat. When the sugar is warmed by the pale hearth light, the happiness spreads throughout the night. He he ha ho to the workshop people go, Uncle Sweetshare is coming near to spread his candy and his cheer. It's better than trinkets, games or toys, so say all the little girls and boys. He he ha ho to the workshop people go, candy candy he makes so much, Uncle Sweetshare has a magic touch. So it's back to the workshop in the snow with lovely lanterns all aglow. He he ha ho, he 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 ha ha ho. Now outside of the cabin we also have a nice red lantern glowing away in the snow and a nice green lantern glowing away in the snow giving a nice Christmassy vibe which is a vein that runs rich through this slab of polar stone. Now inside the cabin we will find an insane Nord alchemist called Uncle Sweetshare ranting and rapping away lines from his nursery rhyme. He he he, ha ho, to the workshop he will go. My uncle's candy is so sweet, it's such a yummy winter's treat. When the sugar is warmed by the pale half light, the happiness spreads throughout the night. He he he, ha ho, to the workshop he will go. Uncle Sweetshare is coming near to spread his candy and his cheer. It's better than trinkets, games, or toys. So say all the little girls and boys. He he he, ha ho, to the workshop he will go. Candy, candy, he makes so much. Uncle Sweetshare has a magic touch. So it's back to the workshop in the snow, with lovely lanterns all aglow. Hee hee ha ho, hee hee he, ha ha ho. Now it's likely that he's been driven mad by the constant consumption of moon sugar, which as we can see, he is actually cooking up as if there were a shortage of white stuff outside and he has to replace the snow with something. No doubt he is the cause of the moon sugar-esque goings-ons in Fort Frostmoth. He will also be wearing a unique white Colovian fur helm, similar to one we might expect to see around Christmas. Now this bloke is a clear and twisted allusion to Santa Claus. The similarities being obvious, living in a cabin, in the snow, sneaking into people's houses and giving them gifts, or moon sugar in this case, having an assistant, being jolly and rhymy, so on and so forth. But originally this chap was meant to be much closer in relation to Santa Claus, as he was originally a Breton character called Grandfather Frost. In Slavic cultures, Santa Claus is known as Dead Morez, which translates literally to Old Man Frost or Grandfather Frost, just as this bloke here is called. He was also meant to have a unique Colovian fur helmet, but in red. The red hat was never implemented onto Grandfather Frost, nor was it implemented onto Uncle Sweetshare, but it can all still be found in the game's files. Of course, having a red furry hat like this makes him much more similar to Santa Claus. Just as we find Menashi outside, Uncle Sweetshare's assistant, Grandfather Frost had an assistant called Singor, who was a Bosma. So we would have had Grandfather Frost with his assistant, who was a tiny elf, 
just as Santa Claus has elves helping him in his workshop in the snow. Singor also carried the song of Grandfather Frost, which is exactly the same as the song as Uncle Sweetshare, with the exception of the name being changed to Grandfather Frost. So, there's a wintry treat for you all. Be sure to grab all the moon sugar before departing this fear and loathing in Solstheim scene. Ah, oh, yes, this next one isn't so much of an easter egg as it's more of an uber secret that you need to know about. In the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind, there are two whole sets of Daedric armor. One is worn by Divaith Fear, who you'd have to kill to get his set. The second complete set of Daedric armor has to be painstakingly pieced together across Morrowind and all of its expansion packs. Dungeons are plundered, lands and quests and factions, blah blah blah, it will basically take you the whole game to complete a set of Daedric armor. Now, for whatever reason, on top of Castle Karstag's roof, which we have to levitate to, there is a small tower known as the Tower of Castle Karstag. In here we can find a single Reekling just standing guard, it would seem. But buried away in the back, wedged into a tight little gap, is where we can find the only discoverable Daedric right pauldron in the entire game. Now the only discoverable Daedric left pauldron is found in the Tribunal expansion, which we'll cover in that easter egg video. But for now, be sure to come here and collect this exceedingly rare piece of armor, which has the highest armor rating of any shoulder piece in the game, and is tucked away in such snowy secrecy. In the frozen sea to the north of the Skull Village we can find an abandoned ship. Floating in the water next to it is a rotted barrel, inside of which we can find a bunch of shoes, which makes me think that this ship may have belonged to a necromancer, as they were clearly someone who collected souls. Anyway, on the mast of this creaking vessel perched like a crown we can find a lantern. Now this isn't just any old iron light chucker either, this is a mysterious unique lantern called the Watchman's Eye, and it casts light in a radius of 42.5 feet, which is more than double of any other carryable light source in the game. For some reason it appears to have a particular affinity to the number 5. As it has a weight of 5, its worth is 500 gold, its light stat is 512, and it lasts for 500 seconds. That's if you are carrying it. I would highly suggest not carrying it as a light source, as it will expire after 500 seconds, and therefore you'll destroy a unique item for 500 seconds of light, and if you enter a body of water while carrying a lantern, it will be instantly destroyed upon contact with the water. So, I would suggest you either store it in your house, or use it in your house as a custom light source. Regardless, it might seem simple, but it's super interesting and rather hauntingly mysterious. But while exploring the northern regions, you should definitely keep an eye out for it. Now during Morrowind's main questline, if we visit the Ghost Gate after accepting the Dwemer Artifact Wraithguard from the Tribunal Poet Warrior God Vivek, before going and defeating Dagoth Ur, if we visit the Ghost Gate, and specifically the Tower of Dusk, this rather average old Imperial Warrior named Wolf will have randomly appeared. Now Wolf will offer us an old man's lucky coin that he asks us to carry to Dagothor for him, but interestingly, when we accept this coin, it will actually give us a new power, called Luck of the Emperor, which upon use will fortify our luck attribute by 20 points for 2 minutes. Now once we leave the Ghost Gate after this interaction, Wolf will simply and mysteriously vanish. A very strange encounter indeed. Now if we go to the Imperial capital on Vardenfell, the Dragon Port of Ebonheart, and take a pious pilgrimage to the Imperial chapels and hunt down the Imperial cult priestess Latalia Varian and ask her about Wolf and the old man's lucky coin, she will explain that Wolf is in fact a physical manifestation and aspect of Tiber Septum. So it turns out we were visited and gifted by Tiber Septim himself. Now before we get to how this relates to Solstheim, just quickly, if we kill Wolf or pickpocket him, he won't have anything of particular interest on him, although he will be carrying a bunch of moon sugar, quite clearly suggesting that Tiber Septim likes to dabble in the uh, extra dimensional arts and walk on very, very warm sands. Anyway, now keeping all of this in mind, once we completely build up the town of Raven Rock, 
provided we chose to have a smith built over the general trader, well, you guessed it, we will have a blacksmith built in the town, run by an imperial woman named Sabrina Vitalia, who is none other than the very smith that we chose to have in the town of Raven Rock. Anyway, while there is no mention of Wolf, or any other reason to suspect that Sabrina is anything special. If we take a look at the shelf behind her, where she keeps her dishes and bowls and cups, on the lower shelf, we can actually find a single coin. This coin is exactly the same as the one that Wolf gave us. It's the old man's lucky coin. Now, there are two of these in the game. One is given to us by Wolf, and the other is unexplainedly here. So it would seem that this Imperial Smith, Sabrina, has also been visited by Tiber Septim himself, or at least his physical aspect, Wolf, just as we were. It's definitely a super intriguing find that would go unnoticed if we didn't go digging through her dirty dishes, and one I'm sure passes most players by. Ah uh, yes, now with Solstein being Nordic in origin and aspect, it draws a lot of inspiration from real life Celtic and Norse cultures and mythos, and we can find many examples of this throughout the Blood Moon expansion, which we're going to run through and then we'll get to the final easter egg which is one thick boy. So all throughout Solstein we can find these naked barbarians called Berserkers, who are clearly a reflection of the real life Celtic clans of Berserkers who would enter battle naked, just as the Berserkers here in Blood Moon do. Now the Draugr in Blood Moon are shuffling hunched undead Nords to patrol and protect the tombs of the dead. They take their name and their traits from the Draugr of the same name from Norse mythology, which were reanimated undead, flesh blackened in decay, skulking through tombs, protecting their treasure in life, now through undeath, just as the Draugr here in Solstheim do. Similarly, the Spriggans we find around Solstheim appear to be based off of the Huldra from Norse mythology, which were a nymphetic forest spirit said to be incredible, seductive, and beautiful, luring in foresters and hunters, quite literally giving them hard wood. In a similar vein, all throughout Solstheim, particularly in caves, barrows, and ice-encrusted hovels, we can find an enemy called the Fleece Hag. These are a type of witch, always Nord and always female. Their name, Fleece, means freeze in Danish, and with a hag being a haggard witch, their name literally means frost witch or freeze witch. So don't cross them or you'll be given the cold shoulder. Now, during the quest, the patchwork airship that we picked up from Louis Beauchamp in the Redoran capital of Aldrun on the mainland Vardenfell will be sent into the northern frost fields of the Mosering Mountains region of Solstein to enter Hrothman's Barrow and enter the Eye of the Great Wolf. Well, once we get to this location, sure enough, we can find the barrow and its entrance, but from the sky or seen from the local map, the barrow, the eye, is actually, quite literally, the eye of a giant wolf formation made of ice and stone that surrounds the crypt. Now, the wolf this formation represents was known as Undjaga, whose name loosely translates to evil hunter in Danish and Norwegian, which is fitting as he slew a great Nord hero, Hrothmund, the one we spoke about of earlier in the Beowulf Easter egg. And at the end of a long questline called the Cursed Captain that we pick up from Thormor Greywave on the western coast of Solstheim, we'll be given a key to a secret burial crypt known as Yilinhul Barrow. Inside we can find mounds of treasure, seas of booty, troves of gems and artifacts. Together there is 10,110 gold, two Staltrim, an ebony cuirass, an ebony longsword, a glass helm, a glass sword of frost, three emeralds, three diamonds, three rubies, a pearl, an exquisite amulet, and an exquisite ring along with an apothecary stash of exclusive potions. Now the name of this location, Yilinhul, translates to Golden Hollow or Golden Hole in Danish, rather fitting as this location is literally a hollow slash hole full of gold. Ah uh, yes, and now we move on to the final easter egg, or secret of Bloodburn, I mean it's a bit of both. To be honest, this one's pretty thick. 
Now in the far western bosks of the Is Infier Plains we can find a barrow called Gili the Mumbling's Dwelling, inside of which lives the man from which the hovel got its namesake, a Nord warlock and seer named Gili the Mumbling. He will ask us to recover his friend Odfrid Whitelip, who was stolen by Draugr and taken to Kolbjorn Barrow, found deep in the Herstang Forest. Now once we arrive at this barrow we'll find the Draugr and we'll scan the area for this missing woman, but all we will find is her skull. Be sure to grab that, and once we bring it back to Gilear the Mumbling, surprisingly everything seems to be in order. Apparently, Odfrid White Lip has been long dead and was once a very powerful seer and soothsayer, and that apparently the skull speaks through Gilear the Mumbling. Now, our only reward that's offered to us for retrieving this skull is to have our future foretold. Now, if we have not finished the Blood Moon expansion's main quests, the future foretelling for us will be the time for the hunt is near, you are both hunter and hunted, referencing the final stages of the main quest line for the expansion Blood Moon. However, if we have finished the Blood Moon expansion's main quests, well what's next? Hmm. We'll wrap your soul around this one. If we've completed the DLC, we'll get this prophecy instead. When the dragon dies, the empire dies. Where is the lost dragon's blood, the Empire's sire? And from the womb of the void, who shall stem the blood tide? Sound familiar? That's because it's foretelling the events of the next Elder Scrolls game, the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion. Now, this goes even further. As well, before the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion's release, these words muttered to us as a foreshadowing of our future remained a mystery. But as the release date for the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion approached, a countdown appeared on the official Elder Scrolls website, where on a number of splash screens, the rest of Odfrid Whitelip's prophecy was revealed. When the dragon dies, the Empire dies. Where is the lost dragon's blood, the Empire's sire? and from the womb of the void who shall stem the blood tide. So long as the blood of the dragon prince runs strong in her rulers, the glory of the empire shall extend in unbroken years. His heart's blood bleeds in darkness, for once the portals are opened, who shall shut them upon the rising tide? For Lord Dagon forever reborn in blood and fire from the waters of oblivion. Find him and close shut the marble jaws of oblivion. In this prophecy, the dragon refers to the Septim Emperors and their dragon-born bloodline, in this case Uriel Septim VII. The Dragon Prince being Tiber Septim and the Empire itself is referred to as her. The Void is a synonym for Oblivion of course, and the Blood Tide refers to the Daedric Hordes coming out of the portals like a tide sweeping a shoreline. The next line remarks the need to find the Septim Heir, that being Martin Septim. The Lost Heir again is Martin Septim telling us we need to find him to close the gates, and the last line excluding the word marble are actually the very last words that Uriel Septim says in the Oblivion trailer. Find him and close shut the jaws of Oblivion. And they are in fact the very last words ever spoken by Uriel Septim. Find the last of my blood and close shut the marble jaws of oblivion. Before he is assassinated before our very eyes. So, yeah, all that professorial nonsense coming out of a mumbling Nord warlock in a dirt hole in a frozen corner of Tamriel, mouth piecing for a whispering old skull. I mean, geez Louise, who would have believed it? But it turns out it was foreshadowing three years into the future, the prophecy of the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion. Who would have known? It's all a bit bananas, but how's that for a bloody easter egg chaps? Anyway, with that double yoker, we have now delved deep into all of the easter eggs and notable secrets that I could find in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind's final expansion, Blood Moon. I do hope you have thoroughly enjoyed this nostalgic visit to Morrowind and Solstheim, and I do hope you've learnt of something new within the game. Perhaps this has even created a spark to replay. Whatever this video may have done for you, I hope you enjoyed it, and if you know anyone who would be into this kind of stuff, be sure to share it with them. 
that would bring me great pleasure. If you did enjoy this video, please leave a like, and if you have anything to add or know of something I missed, be sure to leave a comment. Links to my other Easter egg videos that I've already done can be found down in the description via the playlist link. Down there, you may also find all of my social media links. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter, along with joining our brand new Discord server. I'd very much enjoy seeing you there. Now, if you would like to support the channel in a more personal way, you can do so on Patreon or join the channel right here on YouTube with a join button. As I'm sure you know, all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy. So your support is most genuinely appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much for supporting my channel. And I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.